This is the Dog Savant Podcast with your host, Brett Endes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode three. I'm Brett Endes. I'm your host. I am the Dog Savant. I am a problem behavior specialist. Uh, Today's episode is going to be on the subject of separation anxiety in dogs. Uh, Before we get to that, I just want to take care of a little business, if you will. Um, You can visit my website, dogtrainingla.com. If you do not know me and have never uh, listened to or watched the podcast before, I'm a dog trainer here based in Los Angeles. 25 years I've been doing this. Uh, I specialize in problem behaviors, usually the most severe of them. Um, So I want to talk about different subjects, uh, different ideas of life, um, you know, all tying into the whole dog behavior thing. Uh, But stay tuned. We're going to, we're just getting going. This is only episode three. So I want to just kind of, you know, we'll evolve as we go. Bear with me. I'm getting my, uh, you know, my uh, bearings here. So uh, as I get more into this, I think you're going to get more interesting content. We'll have some guests here and there. So uh, stay tuned. And with that said, rate, review, subscribe. Um, you know, the only way this podcast is going to get found to keep this going is through you guys. So, uh, you know, show your support. And also anytime you guys have a dog training question, I love it. Send me an email, post it on my social media, send me a video of pick, you know, of your dog and what you're struggling with. I'd love to address these things on future podcast episodes as well. Okay. Separation anxiety. Um, I find that separation anxiety is bar none, one of the most challenging, Uh, One of the most misunderstood um, and difficult to, you know, resolve uh, behavioral issues you're going to find in dogs. And the biggest thing here is the most misunderstood. And how do you know that? Or how do I know this? I see a lot of retrain cases. I see a lot of clients who have tried something with their dog that didn't work or seemed to make the problem worse. And these are a lot of unrelated people telling me their stories of the information they had found online or what their veterinarian or previous trainer recommended or what they had tried and was not or was successful. So what I give you, okay, is not my opinion. This isn't how I feel about it. This is two plus decades of experience seeing many clients on a daily basis dealing with these problems consistently in a lot of, again, unrelated situations. So I just go by the feedback of when someone tells me something is working and I see the results of it, I'm going to feel pretty confident that although the dogs can't speak to me, I have a pretty good knack for something working. And if it's humane for the dog and, of course, ultimately improves their quality of life, I'm going to try to share that information. Because I know a lot of people, when it comes to dog behavior, sometimes they have a naysayer approach or they feel that it's working better. And hey, if what you apply works, more power to you. I'm just coming from my experience. And I have been around a lot of dogs and owners in applied settings. So um, I just want to share this so that anyone whose dogs may be struggling with these issues that we talk about can uh, help hopefully resolve that for, for their pet as well. Um, so separation anxiety. Um, I'm going to tell you my approach, how I address this and where the, you know, we have to understand where this comes from. Why are some dogs anxious? Why are some not? Um, you know, how does that come about? Is it the dog, the breed, their life experiences, the owner's fault, whatever it may be. Um, and I also want to be able to talk about you know, kind of some of the misconceptions as far as why dogs have separation anxiety and some of the information out there. We're going to go through and I'm going to Google separation anxiety in dogs and just go through some some of the information we find, whether it be good and helpful, um, not so great and maybe detrimental or just, you know, try your best, but I don't think it's going to work. A lot of things, you know, we get into the magic crystal realm and maybe in a complimentary way they can, they can help the issue, but there's no such thing as a quick fix pill when it comes to behavioral issues in dogs, especially, uh, something like dealing with separation anxiety. So I'm going to talk about this as if I'm sitting in front of a client, we have a dog that's experiencing this, and they want to know why is their dog having this issue, and what are we going to do about it? Okay, so there are certain dogs that are very hypervigilant in the everyday life and shared experiences and environments that we create around them. Um, Now, this hypervigilance could be wiring. Some dogs are just ready to go all the time. These are very, you know, they can be driven, they're hyperactive, whatever you want to be. Some breeds can be a little more than that, but I find that I can talk about separation anxiety in any type of dog, uh, you know, breed, mix, whatever it is. And so I don't want to just get us caught up in that kind of breed 
bias kind of thinking because it kind of keeps us in this locked in way of seeing it than this more open minded way of approaching dog behavior more how they see each other is just you're a dog I'm a dog how do we relate um, so this hyper vigilance in a lot of cases can come from wiring can come from life experiences I see a lot of dogs that have lived on the street prior to um, you know, being in their home or getting rescued and whatnot. And what happens is, is that that hypervigilance kept them alive. It kept them from getting hit by a car. It kept them, you know, finding their food or keeping away from strangers, you know. So they feel like, I'm alive still because of this hypervigilance. Who's going to tell me otherwise? And now when you get them back at home, they try to carry it over, not realizing that we're now keeping them safe, providing their needs, and we have to show them that that is happening so they can let go. Um, another way is just because, you know, a dog... Uh, got away with it. You know, some dogs, you know, maybe the owners were encouraging certain ways of operating that I'm going to talk about next that in our everyday relationship, our coming and goings and transitions around the house can contribute to the problem behaviors as well, like separation anxiety. Others as well. You'll see there's a big theme about that. Uh, you know, when I talk about how dogs end up with all these type of issues, um, and a lot of them is with separation anxiety, it's that hypervigilance around the house. They're too ready to go. I would say they're always waiting for the next shoe to fall. So you get these dogs that, you know, everything's fine. You're hanging out watching TV. You get up off the couch and they're like right on it. And it's like they're clinging to you like a satellite. And it's like they feel that that constantly keeping track of what we do because quite frankly, we're living our lives. We're not watching every move our dogs make and give them, them direction. And sometimes they feel that we're distracted because we're just doing our everyday chores and routines. And to them, that's not like staying in the moment the way dogs want to kind of keep things present. And what happens is, is they start becoming um, unable to stay in the moment, right? So they start over anticipating that what's next, what's next kind of thinking. And then they feel like, okay, if I just know that that person gets up and does this and they start creating this in their mind, like they're following our patterns too strongly because we have our routines and it drives them nuts. We don't see that nuts. We just see, oh, our dog's so excited and enthusiastic to be around us, but then here's the carryover. Once we leave, those ducks are not in a row. They cannot keep track of our activity. They can't get this feeling that by monitoring and moving and getting this autonomic nervous system response when people come and go and, you know, and move around the house transition-wise, it's like, how do I deal with this? Because acting in this hyper-excited state, I wake up another day and I end up with my food and my shelter and the people around me are protected and this undertone of that anxiety, they can't get their heads around why they can't exist in this always anticipating the next move because you're out somewhere else. And then when you come back, it's like, oh, that, ang that anxiety got that to all happen. So there's that kind of cause effect, but there's also that relational end of it that Although we don't see the issue when we're living with our dog real time, it directly results in our dog having these anxieties when we're not there. Now, the reason why we are not able to do that is most people misinterpret separation anxiety as a time duration thing where the dog needs to get used to being alone for longer or they miss their owner, which is a very human projected interpretation of what's really going on. And that's why a lot of what you read online is what do I do when the dog is alone. It's never addressing the relational quality. It's not talking about what do I do when I'm actually home to make it carry over to when I'm not there. And we're going to talk about there are some strategies that we have to put in place when the dog's alone to help them kind of settle in and kind of ride it out. But we need that to take a little bit better initially. Otherwise, the dog is just going to keep this state going because it's working when we're there in real time to get their needs met. And it's an illusion. We're all taking great care of our dogs. We love our dogs. We're not, it's just in their head. And that's where dog behaviors stem from. The, at least the problem ones is that misinterpretation that we make towards them and they make towards where their level of responsibility has to, you know, kind of go to. And dogs, and I haven't met one yet, they can. They're not really good at feeling terribly responsible for everyday doings. They like direction. They like structure. They like, you know, limited choices and responsibility. And if heaven forbid they have to do their protective duties or over assess, that's when they can step in. You know, if you're hunting with your dog, you want them to think independently. If your dog's trying to protect you from an intruder, go do your job there. But short of that, which is not very common daily experiences, your dog shouldn't really give a shit whether you're going to the bathroom or not. They should be pretty good at kind of laying around, hanging out, waiting for you to summon the next event instead of jumping and hinging on every move we make. Again, see the carryover. If that's their lifestyle and then they can't manifest that because you're at work, it's very hard for them to figure out why until you come back and then they're operating that way to get their needs and resources taken care of. 
Um, so that's why, okay? Um, and we're going to talk a lot about, when I look online here, the whys that some people interpret that just limits their ability to see the solution. So let's talk about the solution to the why, because we're not even at the point of what do we do when our dogs are alone. We have to talk about the everyday relation end of it, relational end of it. Um, so we have to create structure. We have to create direction. We have to teach our dogs to fall back and stay in the moment because, quite frankly, we're going to be living our lives around them. So we have to teach them how to kind of go with the flow more. And this is where I like to do a lot of place training, a lot of duration training, which means a dog can hold their mind in a command state for a long duration of time. And that takes practice. It is like building a muscle. It is focus building. It's great for any applied training where your dog can listen and maintain the command until it's completed to task. But you also need them to be able to do that even if you're just going from one room to the next or when you, you know, you're greeting or you have guests come or prior to things like walks or meal times, you need to have that buffer, that kind of non, I talked in the last episode about the mental rubber band. Well, they, in their mind over, and look, humans get anxiety that way. What I have anxiety. How, why? Because I over anticipate too many future events and I feel pulled out of my skin and it creates an uncomfortable disconnect. Dogs do it in a more physical way, but it's the same thing. And for them, it's a much more simple life. So we can create that non-anxious state if we take the time to give them direction while we are doing our everyday life that they may be getting caught up in, like I said earlier. Um, so place training. I have a lot of videos on that, but it's basically, and we'll talk more specifically, but it's teaching your dog how to focus in a command. I like to use a bed or a cot or an area where the dog can just have a very clear, because this is some heavy lifting. Your dog gets up to follow you to the next room. Guess what? You've got to bring them back and show that I am keeping track of things. I need the order. And if you want to come with me, I'm going to give you a command to heal you. So everything is more directed. They're probably going to be getting the same life. All their needs are met, of course, but there's more of this direction, more of them having a job, a structure. We're taking control. A lot of people misinterpret what pack leader is because Caesar Milan, um, you know, although I don't think he's the worst thing in the world, he should, he made it a little too physical, a little rough. And then the older trainers before him, um, you know, like guys I learned from, it, 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 you know, it even took it a little further with the whole alpha rolling shit, and it just goes too far. So the pack leader term gets really misinterpreted as something more physically domineering, you know, BDSM kind of mode, really what it is. What's a pack leader? It's a good boss. It's a good mentor. It's a good teacher, a good parent. It's somebody who leads, somebody who knows the dynamics of the relationship or life's experiences better than the other party. And in a non-threatening way, yet very direct and very consistent and persistent, teaches that party better than what they're doing on their own. That's what the definition of parenting is, mentorship, uh, of course, being a, a leader to your dog, however you want to see it, parent, I don't care how you see it, just do it. That's all that matters. Okay, so by doing this, you're going to start addressing that thing in your dog where they kind of start 180-ing and how they interpret the relationship between you and them. It's going to create this idea in your dog's mind that maybe things are going the other way as far as who's keeping track of who. And that for a dog is the nature of the relationship. Up until a couple hundred years ago, dogs really were meant to have some kind of utility purpose. You know, I would say, I think we loved them. We thought they were cute. They had some kind of relational element where they were interacting with us socially, but a lot of it was because life wasn't that easy for us. We had to put them to work, and they liked that. They were satisfied. That's why if you do something with your dog that simulates it, they tend to be more at peace. They tend to have less of an issue where they're going to be acting out, you know, at other times of their life. And that's, again, even if you just give them some more structure in your living room and around the house and you disengage that impulsivity that we sometimes do towards dogs that isn't helping them in certain cases, um, it's only going to benefit them. Like when we come home and our dogs are wild to see us, put a leash on and create a little place training, let them decompress, then say hi to them. So they get rewarded for a calmer, more go with the flow state upon transition. And that's a biggie. The, the, the coming and goings when you first depart and arrive is probably the most critical transition you're going to create if your dog has a separation anxiety issue. So you really got to do a lot of prep. You have to kind of rewire them to make different patterns and associations as far as they don't link up that within two seconds of you grabbing your keys, you're out the door. You might want to have them see a lot of different patterns. So they're kind of relying more on you to dictate how it goes instead of, oh, there we go again. I knew it was going to go that way. And then it just spikes them in their anxiety. That's, that's how it works for humans too. Um, so that's a lot of that prep, and I have plenty of videos. I have a web series I created um, in my series coming out here on Juke and Media. We're going to do, I'm sure, a lot of place training demos, so you're going to see that. 
Um, but that is really that structure around the house, certain rules, boundaries, and limitations, as yes, Mr. Milan says, it really is something that's going to create the basis of why your dog is more balanced. And we're talking about any kind of behavioral issue. So let's talk about what we do when we're our dogs are alone, okay? So when our dogs are alone, that's important too. But like I said earlier, the information that you're gonna see mostly is how to deal with that end of it and not the cause of why the dogs have an issue being alone. So a crate, right? We talk, we hear a lot about a crate confinement. First off, a crate should not be seen as punishment. It should not be associated as your dog only goes in it when they're alone. It's not going to help. And if your dog is too used to zipping around the house independently, reacting to every move you make, a crate is never going to take because they're too used to moving, again, independently, instead of feeling more at peace of being directed of where to be and how to think at certain times where it's better for them. And that's what place training helps with. So a dog that learns place is going to learn how to acclimate to the crate better. That's the instinct, that's the way, the relational way they're going to accept it. Then the conditioning way is getting them used to the crate, putting them in there with treats, of course, feeding them in the crate, and letting them see it as just an everyday thing. I tell clients, just put the crate in your living room and watch TV for an hour and let them hang out with you and then start walking away and leaving and separating. But let them just see, teamed up with that structure with the place training, how that it's really not the worst thing to be in a confined space. And why do we use a crate when they're alone? Dogs, again, don't do well with too many choices they don't understand. So once a dog does learn to acclimate to and accept the crate, their mind actually shifts. That's why a lot of people, and you may be recognizing in your dog when they're in the crate or they're in a small little tucked away space, they're more relaxed. They're more sensory deprived. And that's what the crate's supposed to do when they're alone. Why? Because we have to have some kind of starting point to get them to accept the situation while we're working on the cause of why the anxiety happens in the first place. Eventually, your house should become like a giant crate to them, but we have to kind of slowly segue. The other tip I give, and this is something a lot of trainers won't tell you, and I, I picked, you know, I discovered this in my work a couple of years ago. The location of the crate when they're alone is very important. You need to have them out of the main area of the house, especially if it's facing a door, even a window, because to them, they have a where there's a will, there's a way thinking. So if they see the door, even if they're in the crate, it's that mental rubber band again. They're just projecting like, if I just fix it and they can't just relax. So a lot of times if the crate is in a off the beaten path, kind of a back bedroom, more quiet, again, sensory deprived, the music you can play, you can give them something to chew on in there is fine. Uh, but really the context of the crate and where it's located, especially when you first start you know, doing these departures, um, it's really important for a dog to learn to accept it. Because really what we're trying to do is get a dog to remain conscious, whether it be around the house when you're home or when they're alone on their own. And they learn that by not overreacting by not letting the anxiety spike. They're like, I'm alive still. And then they see it with their own eyes and then that starts taking a life of its own. Um, but again, we have to work on everything in a complementary way. We have to make sure the dog's getting the right nutrition, the right exercise. There's so many facets to this and we have to be really thorough because this is a dog that's treating everyday life like it's going to be the end of theirs. And we know that's not. But if we try to console them, we try to tell them it's okay, we try to give in or we never leave or let them learn how to grow, they're never going to learn how to grow. Okay, so that's important. Um, I think that I think I cut Jordan, did I cover all the topics for separation anxiety? You think is there anything that any dog owner should know other than what I told them? Pretty concise. Okay, so let's I'm concise. Listen to that. Okay, so let's go online and let's see what other dog professional trainers. So, oh, I had it already queued up here. Okay, let's go to ASPCA because they're a big one. They're the first thing that comes up when you type up separation anxiety. Common, you know, so... I'm not going to say anything. I have no preconceived notions and I just want to read. Um... Okay, I'm going to read this to you guys. I'll kind of, you know, skip just for the sake of not boring you. But uh, okay, so one of the most common complaints of pet parents, right there, they start using these buzzwords like pet parents, fur babies, things that are going to invoke emotion instead of rational thought, which is, it's like a math problem. This is this, this is this, we need this as the outcome instead of oh, I feel a certain way about two plus two. You're blinded. You're not going to be thinking pragmatically, and animals need that from us. 
They're the ones getting overly emotional when there's not a need to. We have to be sure-footed in when dealing with this. Okay. So they talk about the destructive when left alone. Dogs might urinate, defecate, bark, how to dig, try to escape, of course. All these problems often again, the dog needs to be taught polite house manners. They can also be symptoms of distress. Again, invoking emotion and putting it on like, don't blame the dog. We're not blaming the dog, but we also have to be realistic and there is an issue. Okay, we can't say, oh, this poor dog, that's safe space thinking. And that doesn't work for children, it doesn't work for dogs. Okay, very, I'm very anti safe space. Um, and then it talks about a kind of distress baby drooling, anxiety, parents, and more parents stuff. Dog is in house train, and then the toys chew, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they talk about just how escape attempts by dogs with separation anxiety are often extreme. It can result in self injury, household destruction, especially around exit points like windows and dogs, doors. Yes. And that's the same reason why you don't want the crate in the main room because if they can't physically get to the door, which is where they're just projected on the other side and they're work. That's why I've seen dogs chew door handles, dig through, like scratch and chew through actual walls and the insulation to get to the outside, crash through windows because they're so projected they don't even see. They're just one track minded to get closer to where they think the owner went to catch up with keeping order of things. So um, it gets pretty extreme. It's, you know, kind of case by case, but I've seen some pretty nasty ones. So they go through all your different symptoms, urinating, defecating, barking, howling, chewing, digging, destruction, escaping, pacing, coprophagy, just eating shit. Uh, why do dogs develop separation anxiety? Okay. There is no conclusive evidence showing exactly why dogs develop separation anxiety. See, that's the thing. They don't always develop it. Sometimes it's a wiring. Just certain dogs have more of that potential, and we have to be realistic of that's how our dogs are. I have a child with autism. Um, when they told me she had autism, I didn't deny that, or I didn't want it. It's just, okay, what do we do? How do we adjust, or what do we have to do to make her thrive? And it has to be, again, that pragmatic, that more um, rational versus emotional in dealing with things like this. Why? Because something else or someone else is relying on you to not get caught up in it to be the guide, the helper, the mentor, the leader. Um, so uh, it says uh, far more dogs who have been adopted from shelters have this behavior problem than those kept by a single family since puppyhood. Mm, I think it's just because they had the problem and they ended up in those shelters because of it. Um, then a, other less dramatic changes can also trigger this disorder. This following is a list of situations that have been associated with separation anxiety. Now, you heard me talk about what I have found to be the root cause in separation anxiety. As far as by addressing this as the reason, it seems to fix it when I have my clients apply it that way. So let's see the difference of that versus the anthropomorphic way that is more of like a reason why a human would have some kind, because there is separation anxiety in children and humans as well, but it's a much more complicated emotional thing. It's not just a physical proximity thing. Um, Okay, so change of guardian or family. Being abandoned, surrendered to a shelter, given a new guardian or family can trigger separation anxiety. Usually they came with it, or they were dogs that were living on the street, and that hypervigilance was effective, and now they have to learn better ways of operating. Uh, change in schedule. That's if your dog is already, again, hanging on to your patterns too much instead of falling back in life and kind of knowing that you're going to take care of their needs on your schedule based upon when it has to happen to have their daily uh, needs accommodated. So um, dogs shouldn't be so caught up in a schedule. They should know, hey, you're going to feed me when it's the right time, walk me, pet me, whatever. They shouldn't be seeking and desperate and hinging on, I didn't get fed at six o'clock, I'm going to short circuit. That's too much. That's going to create anxiety in itself. Um, change in residence, moving to a new residence, that's the same as change of guardian family. Change in household membership, um, sudden absence of a resident family member, due death, moving away. I find, you know what I find in that? Like, let's say you have like, you know, I find something like, like the male of the household died or whoever was kind of the one who did the most training or was the boss, you know, if they, they'll say. Um, it's just because that boss is now gone and the dog had to step into a position they couldn't handle and a lot of times they'll overly assess and then there's your cause of separation anxiety. So um, it's not like, oh, they are grieving and all that. Dogs are so much easier than people emotionally. They're pretty good at just being at peace regardless of changes as long as their needs are met and they don't have to overassess it. Um, rule out some medical problems, yes, um, you know, for urination. And I rule out that. I'll rule out um, 
potty issues if the dog's peeing when they're gone. You know, sometimes it is triggered by the separation anxiety, but a lot of times it's just they have an, an issue separate from that. Or in uh, concurrent, you know, what do you call that? Comorbid or that's human stuff. But like they, they, they're, it's, they got both issues. Okay, um, other behavior problems to rule out. So they just, it's a lot, it's just all about this potty training, juvenile destruction, which I've never used that term ever. Boredom, sure, dogs sometimes need more. And that's what the training around the house does, gives them kind of mental stimulation and, uh, you know, just kind of gives them that feeling of peace because they're getting direction in the relationship. Um, okay, here's our, what to do if your dog has separation anxiety. Treatment for mild separation anxiety. If your dog has a mild case of separation anxiety, counter conditioning might reduce or resolve the problem. Counter conditioning is a treatment process that changes the animal's fearful, anxious, or aggressive reaction to a pleasant, relaxed one instead. It's done by associating the sight or presence of a feared or disliked person, animal, place, object, or situation with something really good, something the dog loves. Over time, the dog learns what whatever he fears actually predicts good things for him. The problem is, is that when a dog thinks they're going to die or are afraid of something socially, they'll say, oh, and they're nervous of a, tra- uh, of a stranger, have them give them a treat. Number one, most dogs, when they're freaking out, they don't give a shit about a treat. They're in self-preservation mode. Second of all, your dog is nervous and you give them a treat, you're rewarding and conditioning them to be nervous. You need to bring them up to a better, more neutralized and content state, then you can give them the rewards and that can come with communication, not taking all this all this Kong. And what, see, here's where you lose me. When you start talking about, see, you, see, all you, all, a lot of you very well-known pet information people are really doing this for the bottom line, not really with helping dogs. And here's where it, this is where this is coming from. You start talking about how you do the association. I'm not even going to read because it's all horse shit. You can read it yourself. Um, Give your dog a Kong with the trademark symbol, and then you just start putting Kong in all caps, and it is just a fucking advertisement for Kong, right? That's all it is. And to be honest, a dog is happier with a raw bone than a Kong. It's just a piece of rubber. You put shit in it. Yeah, they're good. You can throw them around. I have a Kong ball we use for Bowie because they're very durable. But um, this, see, you're, you're just, whatever. Okay, so it's an advertisement for Kong. See what happens? This is um, more treatment for, let's go to the severe separation anxiety. Um, it's still, it's all about desensitization and comp- counter conditioning. It's all about the purely positive bullshit. And it's a, and see, and even here, they're saying the CPDT, that's a surly, certified professional dog trainer. That's not a real thing. That's just with one organization that promotes purely positive training. And they're all in cahoots with each other. And this is why these dogs aren't getting help. Okay. Um, so it's all these things where, it, you know, it's the, I'll give you one example because I don't want you, you know, it's, oh, Brett, you're just kind of like unraveled here and you're not giving us what you said you would. Okay, so one treatment approach to this pre-departure anxiety is to teach a dog that when you pick up your keys or put on your coat, it doesn't always mean that you're leaving. You can do this by exposing your dog to these cues in various orders throughout the time. The problem is that the dog is still going to spike and then relax because they made those associations a long time ago. So you need to get your dog in a calmer state then do those exercises. I get it. No, you're you're almost there. You're halfway there on that one. But you still, the place training, getting your dog to just not react and getting to see by not reacting, you do it. And then you reward them. Set the bar higher. These dogs are smart. Get them, get them to a better state of focus. And, and then you could do that. Okay, so I'll give you credit for that. You get a, you get a star for that. Um, graduated departures, absences. See, and this is more where they're talking about the whole like getting your dog used to being alone for longer, longer periods of time. Number one, it's not based on time duration. And to be realistic, owners have to work. They're not going to quit their job for three months and every day incrementally build up five more minutes of time their dog is alone. It's just not realistic. Um, So again, it's more of getting your dog used to being alone for a minute or three hours. It just has to be the concept of not having to assess where you went because you're doing the assessing when you're interacting with them in real time. Um, see, in the crate, they, they say at the very end to crate or not to crate. They don't even want to be definitive about it. And then it talks about how it's going to create more stress and anxiety. Yes, for the reasons though, so you don't talk about the cause because if your dog is used to flying around the house and independently reacting to every move you make and asking for stuff and just always pushing life ahead instead of falling back and letting you lead them, the crate's going to be the antithesis of this. Antithesis, antithesis of this, and what happens is, is that 
it's just never going to take. So any dog could take to the crate if you approach it um, from where a resistance to it is coming from. Oh, I don't like This is actually a longer website than I thought. You know, and then they tell you about things to do with your dog just to give them a full life. I'll give you that. Jobs for your dogs to do the right exercise, mental stimulation, on point, you know, bits and pieces. The problem is if you follow all of this, you end up with, uh, you, you're not going to get full resolve. That's the issue. Medications. Unfortunately, medications, and this is what all vets do. They go right to it. There's very little growth. And I just recently had a case where this dog was heavily medicated. They took her off. And I'm like, boy, she's doing better. Yeah, we finally weaned her off the medicine. It makes them more conscious so that the learning process can even take. Um, I find in very, very extreme cases, medication might be able to help where it's like, hey, we did everything through the kitchen sink at it. Let's just do the fluoxetine. Um, CBD therapy, which is medical cannabis, can help as well. I'm more comfortable with that because it doesn't seem to influence the dog's wiring and it's natural, and it doesn't seem to really do, you know, and again, it's all complimentary. Nothing is going to be a quick fix pill, like I said in the beginning of this, this podcast. It's only going to help the work that you're doing take maybe a little bit better and, and clearer to the dog. Um, so medications, I'm not a big fan of it. If anything, I get too many dogs that are on medication when I start working with them and taking them off seems to help. Um, and the last thing is they tell you what not to do. Do not scold or punish your dog. Um, and it's not a result of disobedience or spite. And it's not. It is, they're just a function of their wiring, life history, and the relationship. So we have to address that. And as I say, when you're doing training, you should be in a business transaction, give a little good regard, give a little bit of directness, like, hey, I mean this. But being aggressive, yelling, whatever, it doesn't really help. Um, we're human. We all probably get frustrated with our dogs. Uh, don't feel guilty if you have, but it's really best to look more into what's causing it, addressing the issue consistently, and then rewarding it when the better potential is met. So you're not relying on rewards, you're not relying on punishment. You're looking at how can I get my dog to make the right choices on their own because I'm communicating how to do that. And with that, then they're going to, with their own eyes, like I said before, realize what's going on and stay conscious when they're having a hard time remaining, you know, in state. And um, then you can reward it as well because then it's actually giving them that ability to, I don't want to say earn, but kind of like see why they're getting the reward um, because you're meeting that potential. Okay, I think uh, I've had uh, enough uh, separation anxiety talk for today. Um, so, uh, we'll do so many more episodes on this subject. I, I, I'm sure I'll get more into detail. Maybe we'll have veterinarians on as guests or someone to talk more in, in depth or the trainers, see how they approach it. Um, so just a final wrap up. I want to give you a little more news. I start shooting the week of August 20th for my show, the untrainables for Juke and media and Facebook. I'm really excited about that. We're going to have 12 initial episodes. Uh, they're going to be short, but they're going to focus on different behaviors and dogs and owners. It's going to be really awesome. So excited, finally making that happen. Uh, and again, rate, review, subscribe to this. When you subscribe, it helps people, other people find this. I just want to help other dog owners. I want to share information. Um, you may, like I said earlier, feel this is opinion, but I'm speaking as matter-of-factly as possible based on dealing with these problems for a very long time and hearing the feedback. I go by the feedback of all of these individual dog owners and what their experiences are in the past and what they're doing with me when applying it. And I'm even learning through them. This is not set in stone. If I give you a podcast on separation anxiety a year from now, I'm probably going to have a more evolved understanding of it than I do now. But my understanding is a little bit more complicated than some of just the basic info online. So like you saw, there's some bits and pieces that I value and kind of coincide with the information I'm telling you. And it's not just my, there's other trainers that get this, but I'm telling you what works for me and my clients so it might work for you and your dog. Thank you so much for watching. Um, have a great day. Love your dog.